The 1933 Nuremberg Rally marked the beginning of fascist rule in Germany and the triumphant entrance of Adolf Hitler onto the world stage. Amongst the 200,000 strong crowd was a 19-year-old British aristocrat named Unity Valkyrie Mitford. This was the start of an extraordinary relationship between one of Winston Churchill's cousins and the Nazi dictator. She was obsessed with meeting Hitler, so she really set out to stalk him. She saw him, it seemed, more than a hundred times. No other English person could have anything like that access to Hitler. Both Unity Mitford and Adolf Hitler came to believe they were meant to be together. Hitler was extremely superstitious, and he believed that Unity was sort of sent to him. It was destined. Unity spent five years as part of Hitler's inner circle and was even rumoured to be his fiancée. But the question of just how intimate they became has remained shrouded in mystery for almost 70 years. Now the release of secret wartime documents has prompted a fresh investigation, revealing new insights into the true nature of their relationship and new evidence connecting Hitler's girl to a discreet maternity home in an Oxfordshire village. What was Unity Mitford doing in a maternity home? Apparently the news of the moment should be the return of Unity Mitford. Folkestone was a battlefield where fixed bayonets were ready to keep the public away from the harbour, where for several days Lord Reedsdale, waiting anxiously for his daughter, became the focusing point for reporters and cameras. In January 1940, there was one story which dominated the headlines in wartime Britain. Finally, the channel steamer arrived, and then thanks to the breakdown of the first ambulance and the consequent delay, our cameraman was able to secure this picture of Miss Unity Mitford. Unity was one of the famous Mitford sisters, eccentric aristocrats who became celebrities in the 1930s thanks to their literary talents and political connections. Unity was notorious for her association with Adolf Hitler. Her return from Nazi Germany in an ambulance was sensational news at home and abroad. Some reporters claimed she had been jilted by Hitler and taken an overdose. Others said she had been shot by the Gestapo, or even by Hitler himself after a lover's tiff. The fact was that Unity had shot herself in the head on the day that war was declared, but had miraculously survived. She claimed not to remember anything, and her only comment was, I'm glad to be in England, even if I'm not on your side. The press and the public called for her to be interned, but even though questions were asked in the House of Commons, Hitler's British girl spent the rest of the war as a free woman. The reason why has been the subject of speculation ever since. Martin Bright is political editor of the New Statesman magazine and has broken numerous stories as an investigative reporter for The Observer. He's begun a new inquiry into what happened when Unity Mitford returned to Britain. The conventional story of Unity Mitford's life when she returns from Germany, having shot herself in the head, is that she lived out the rest of her days as a brain-damaged, incontinent invalid. I'm not convinced that's the whole story. Martin's investigation began with the recently released diaries of Guy Liddell, the wartime chief of MI5. Liddell was responsible for vetting, interrogating and interning anyone suspected of Nazi sympathies, which should have included Unity Mitford. Guy Liddell is convinced that Unity Mitford is someone of, of serious interest in the intelligence services. He's convinced that she should be interrogated, he's convinced that she should be interned. Unity Mitford had been in close and intimate contact with the Fuhrer and his supporters for several years and was an ardent and open supporter of the Nazi regime. She had remained behind after the outbreak of war 
and her action came perilously close to high treason. But Guy Liddell was overruled by the Home Secretary, Sir John Anderson. Nobody was to be searched and no order was to be served. Here you have a woman who was at the heart of Hitler's inner circle, who is allowed to simply pass into normal life uh, without being questioned or interrogated at all. Her mother and father saw her safely in and accompanied her to their home at High Wycombe. Though reported to be wounded, Ms Mitford got home safely, Hitler having placed no obstacle in the way of her return. The fact that Unity was not searched or interrogated means there is no public record of her medical condition when she first came home. A situation which has encouraged all kinds of speculation. Unity Mitford's return to Britain is surrounded by rumour and mystery. We really do not know exactly what happened during those months after her return. There's even the suggestion that she may have been pregnant. The rumours centre on a house in an Oxfordshire village which was supposedly used as a maternity home during the war. After Martin wrote an article in The Observer describing his findings in the Lidl diaries, he was approached by a member of the public. Valerie Han has a family connection to the house and a startling new claim. So, Val, tell me what you know about Unity Mitford. Well, I don't know an awful lot about Unity, except that I believe when she came back from Germany, she went straight to my aunt's house. And the, the, my aunt said to my mother that she had delivered Unity Mitford's baby. Which was, which was quite something in those days. My, I don't suppose my mother knew really who Unity Mitford was, but it's been passed down through the family. All the family knew, and I was told, obviously, uh, but I didn't understand it because I was, <laughs> I was very young. And whose baby was it said that that was? Oh, Hitler. Hitler's baby. Well, that's quite something. The relationship between Unity Mitford and Hitler has been the subject of rumours for almost 70 years. But how intimate were they really? Journalist Martin Bright is meeting Valerie Han, who claims that Unity Mitford was pregnant when she returned to Britain in 1940. So tell me about this family legend. Well, the family legend involves my aunt. My aunt Betty, and her surname was Norton, Betty Norton. And she was a midwife um, in a tiny village in, in Oxfordshire called Wigington. And during that time, she attended the birth of Unity Mitford's child in Wigington at Hillview Cottage. And whose child did she think this was? Well, she, she told my mother that it was Hitler. Hitler's child. I believe, and forgive me because I was only a young child, but I think my mother said it was a boy, but I'm not absolutely sure. And what happened? Did she say what happened to the boy? Well, it would have gone out to the wet nurses whom my, my aunt employed, and then would have gone perhaps to foster parents, and then, I don't know. Nobody knows where this child is. So why did you wait so long to come forward to tell the story? Were you told to keep it a secret? Yes, I was. Um, I was told that it was family, family secret. Now, some people would say that this was completely preposterous, that, that mm -hmm. this is a woman who shot herself in the head, she'd spent yes. a lot of time in the care of doctors in Germany uh, and yes. in Britain. Yes. How could it possibly be the case that she then went on to have a baby? I don't know. I'm just passing on um, uh, or the family legend. Could Unity Mitford really have returned to Britain carrying Hitler's baby. What is certain is that Unity came to believe she was destined to be at Hitler's side and their connection was established before she was even born. In 1913, Unity's parents, Lord and Lady Reedsdale, visited Canada, prospecting for gold. It was here, in a small village called Swastika, that Unity was conceived. The symbol was adopted by the Nazi party just as Unity was struggling to establish an identity in her large and eccentric family. 
Unity found life in her big family very difficult because she came after these cleverer, prettier, more accomplished sisters. By the time Unity was a teenager, her elder sister Nancy was already a famous novelist. While Diana was a celebrated beauty and society hostess. Jessica's talent for writing eventually made her a successful journalist. But Unity struggled to find a niche. If you come from a ruck of children in a large family, you've got to do something to assert your individuality. And I think through the experience of trying to force her way forward among the sisters and in the family, she decided she was going to form um, a personality against everything. Seven hundred miles away in Germany, Adolf Hitler was on the verge of taking power. News of his running battles with communists was filtering back to England in the press. Even teenagers in isolated Oxfordshire villages began taking sides in the new polarised politics of the era. Unity and Jessica shared a room which they divided down the middle with a chalk line and one side was fascism and the other side was communism and Jessica had all her hammers and sickles and her pictures of Lenin and Unity had her swastikas and her pictures of Hitler. I think the desire to shock was very important. It was the way that she made herself special. When she discovered Nazism and discovered that it was a fantastic opportunity to shock everybody in England, she discovered the best tease of all. I mean, they were kids virtually. You don't know how much it was just a game, a game that became deadly serious in later life. In 1932, Unity's involvement with fascism was about to come much closer to home. Fascism is new to Great Britain. Because it is new, it will be attacked by some and laughed at by others. In the same year Unity was coming out as a debutante, Oswald Mosley launched the British Union of Fascists. Almost simultaneously, he began having an affair with Unity's sister, Diana. I first met him at a dinner party in London. And uh, we made friends rather quickly. We live in a period when Britain can only survive by vigour and by action. I was very taken with his ideas. I thought they sounded so sensible and wise. And in fact, as time went on, it turned out that they were. Diana had only been married for three years when she scandalously divorced her husband to become Mosley's full-time mistress. This was considered in the family so shocking that the younger girls, the younger three, of whom Unity was one, weren't allowed to see Diana or visit her and certainly weren't allowed to meet the person that Lord Reedsdale referred to as the man Mosley. That summer, Unity disobeyed her parents. At a party thrown by Diana, she was introduced to Mosley for the first time. When she saw Mosley, she at once called him the leader. The leader says, the leader does this, the leader does that, and the leader promised to give her a badge. And she was frightfully excited by this. Unity became a very extrovert member of the party, which was her way. I mean, anything Unity took up, she sort of overdid it straight away. And one thing she did, she joined my father's party, and she used to, um, to turn up. She used to go around in a, in, in a black shirt uniform, and she used to turn up at communist meetings, and she used to do the fascist salute and uh, heckle the speaker or something. That, that, was, that was the sort of person she was. I remember some conversations between my father and Diana in which my father was saying that Unity, although he was fond of Unity, admired Unity, you know, it was very nice about to be so passionately fascist, but 
she wasn't d doing him any good because she was making a sort of an exhibition of herself. Despite her best efforts, the black shirts felt unity was a liability. In contrast, her sister Diana was the leader's favourite. Diana was the glamorous sister. I mean, they looked alike in a way, but in fact, Diana was a famous beauty, so it was very bad luck on Unity, and going around with Diana would probably be tough for Unity. Mosley, although older, was a very glamorous figure. He had those Errol Flynn, Rudolph Valentino looks that were so fashionable at the time, so that was yet another kind of very dashing thing that one of the older sisters had done. Diana's relationship with Mosley is a very big fact of Mitford life. And what should Unity do about it? So it looks to me as if one thing she could do about it is go one better. In 1933, Adolf Hitler became the Chancellor of Germany. He celebrated by organising the first in an extraordinary series of state-funded rallies. The Nazi Party rallies took place every September in a specially built stadium in Nuremberg. And, of course, Hitler was the star of the show. He would drive through the streets of Nuremberg in, his, in an open car with his hand extended in the fascist salute, and there would be endless screaming and yelling. And, obviously, it generated a feeling of mass hysteria. crowd was Unity Mitford. She had come to Nuremberg with her sister Diana, part of a delegation from the British Union of Fascists. 19-year-old Unity's life was about to change forever. It was an extraordinary spectacle of power. The nearest equivalent that we can give is a huge rock concert. People are somehow losing touch with their own personality and surrendering some part of their personality to the occasion. The Nuremberg rally had a profound effect on both Diana and Unity. I mean, it was so dramatic and gripping and everybody was obviously listening and then Hitler, all by himself, walking up onto the stage. <laughs> Unity was already, as it were, convinced about uh, Hitler, but this turned conviction into worship. As Unity later said, The first moment I saw him, I knew there was no one I would rather meet. From then on, she wanted to be near Hitler as much as possible. She wanted to be in Germany as much as possible. Unity convinced her parents she wanted to learn German. In the summer of 1934, she enrolled at a language school in Munich, close to the headquarters of the Nazi party. She set her, 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 her mind on getting Hitler. And she discovered that Hitler's movements could be ascertained. And it's one of the extraordinary things about Hitler's daily life that he was so available to the public. You knew which cafe he'd be in, you knew which restaurant he'd be in, which hotel, and he would just go and meet people over sticky buns and cakes, and it was possible to meet him like that. And he was in the habit of eating in the Osteria Bavaria in Munich, and she started sitting in the Osteria Bavaria every day. So he would have to come into the front part of the restaurant where there was this English girl. She was making eyes at him. And eventually Hitler said, who is this woman? And somebody said, she's the daughter of an English lord and she very badly wants to meet you. So he said, bring her over.
met and asked her about herself, who are you, what are you doing here? And she said, I'm an English uh, girl. And, uh, and I so admire, I so admire what you're doing in Germany. And so Hitler was intrigued by her. This strange English blonde sort of Aryan came up and was staring at him and obviously adored him. And he was, he was, he was interested. Yeah, sure. After 10 months stalking Hitler, Unity had finally met her idol. They spoke for over half an hour, and Hitler put Unity's meal on his bill. She wrote an 800-word letter to her father, describing the day. It was the most wonderful and beautiful of my life. I am so happy that I wouldn't mind a bit dying. I suppose I am the luckiest girl in the world. For me, he is the greatest man of all time. Unity's relationship with Hitler progressed reasonably fast after she'd met him, and it wasn't too long before she was very much in his uh, kind of inner circle. She would be invited to uh, the party rallies, to sort of state events, so she was very much persona grata. In April 1935, Unity's sister Diana came to visit and was introduced to Hitler for the first time. His manners were very courtly. He kissed hands and ushering ladies to a chair and that sort of thing. And he did have a sense of humour because he very clever at imitations, which is a sign that somebody's very observant. And uh, he could take people off in a very clever way. Apparently Hitler would do um, a mimicry. For, for instance, I think he imitated Mussolini. Um, which would have been rather fun to see, wouldn't it? Everyone else would just said, yes, yes, mein Führer, yes, mein Führer. Unity and Diana wouldn't be scared of him. And I suppose he thought, oh, well, thank God, here's two human beings who aren't scared of me. After meeting Diana, Hitler described the Mitford sisters as the perfect examples of Aryan women. While Diana returned to Britain, Unity stayed in Munich and became even closer to Hitler. So why was the Chancellor of Germany so interested in a 20-year-old British student? I think that Hitler liked Unity for two things, really. I think she entertained him. He liked having sort of pretty young women around him. But there was something else which is quite powerful, which was that Hitler, as is well known, was exceedingly superstitious. He had all kinds of weird ideas about predestination, about his own role in German history and German mythology. The connections between Unity and Hitler did seem uncanny. She had not only been conceived in swastika, her middle name was Valkyrie, after the war maidens in Wagner's opera. Hitler was obsessed with Wagner and was astounded to learn that Unity's grandfather, the first Lord Reedsdale, had been Wagner's friend. Reedsdale had also translated books by racial theorist Houston Stuart Chamberlain, an author who had profoundly influenced Hitler when writing Mein Kampf. When he discovered this link between Wagner, German history and Unity, it would have been for him, a sort of sign that he was, unity was sort of sent to him, it was destined or something like that. Unity and Hitler's relationship soon became the subject of speculation in the British press. Speculation that still continues today. Journalist Martin Bright is trying to substantiate rumors that Unity Mitford gave birth to Hitler's baby. Well, we've got to the stage now where I'm really keen to know whether this birth happened or not. So we've come to the Oxford Registry Office to ask whether any births were registered to the house in Wigginton and whether we can find out whether there was, was any child at all. Reporter Martin Bright has heard a claim that Hillview House was a secret wartime maternity home where Unity Mitford gave birth to Hitler's baby. Martin is visiting the local registry office to see if any element of the story can be substantiated. 
Well, it does seem from the registers that that address has been used for a lot of babies' births. And more babies than would have been possible for a single family. I would think so, yes. I mean, one would expect <laughs> there to be a bit of a gap, whereas these seem to appear very frequently. The records examined by Martin suggest that Hillview House was used as a maternity home during the war, but there is no sign of Unity Mitford's name in the official birth register. Is there such a thing as unregistered births? Indeed, there are. There are. I mean, we do on occasion now get people who come to us and they're absolutely certain that they were born in a, at a particular address and we haven't got any trace of their entry. I mean, obviously, we're talking here pre-National Health Service. We're talking about war years. So I don't know if, if any babies did slip through the net. So these are the indices... For well, it's very tantalising. We've found that the house was indeed a maternity home but we still do not have the confirmation of, uh, of Unity Mitford's child. The question of how intimate Hitler and Unity became has been the subject of gossip and innuendo ever since they first met in 1934. At that time, Hitler had begun courting Ava Brown, but the couple were not yet living together. In May 1935, on hearing of the hours Hitler was spending with Unity, Ava wrote in her diary, She is known as the Valkyrie and looks the part, including her legs. I, the mistress of the greatest man in Germany and the whole world, I sit here waiting while the sun mocks me through the window panes. Somehow he was able to play unity off against Eva Brown. So there's a scene in one of the party rallies when he puts these two women sitting next to each other in his special box. He knew that this could only create trouble. And Eva Brown was jealous of Unity, and Unity was jealous of Eva Brown. So there's some element of sexual rivalry being, being inspired by Hitler. Two weeks after the diary entry, Eva tried to commit suicide by overdosing on sleeping pills. Hitler immediately became more attentive and installed her in a villa with a maid and a Mercedes. For Unity, it was an important lesson. Keeping the Fuhrer's attention required dramatic behaviour. In the summer of 1935, Unity saw an opportunity when she became close to one of Hitler's oldest friends. Julius Streicher, the publisher of hysterical anti-Semitic newspaper Der Stürmer. Streicher's only message, really, is that the Jews are responsible for all the evil of the world and must be killed. And he, he, he was a tremendous fool. He has the lowest IQ of all the Nazis who were tried at um, Nuremberg. Um, and he's just a hideous figure, whom you would have thought repellent just at once. Streicher invited Unity to the Hesselberg Festival, a Nazi youth rally with a pagan theme. Unity got in full Nazi fig for this thing. She's wearing leather and she's wearing gauntlets and she's got her badges and all this. Bit. As Stryker addressed the 200,000 strong crowd of Hitler youth, he invited Unity onto the podium beside him. She stepped up to the microphone and gave an impromptu speech. Her message is Stryker's message that the Jews are responsible for everything bad, which is what Stryker would have wanted her to say. Unity's appearance at Hesselberg was unusual enough to be noted in the British press, but she was about to go a step further. Two weeks later, she wrote an open letter to Stryker's newspaper. The English have no notion of the Jewish danger. Our worst Jews work only behind the scenes. We think with joy of the day when we shall be able to say England for the English, out with the Jews, Heil Hitler. P.S. Please publish my name in full. I want everyone to know that I am a Jew hater. You can't any more think that this is a girl who's just a loose cannon chundering around Germany. Once you take a public position like that, 
the public's going to respond. And the Jewish Chronicle and the Daily Telegraph and the Mirror, all sorts of newspapers then pick her up and say, who's, who's this, what's going on? While unity was condemned in Britain, it was Hitler she was trying to impress, and he soon rewarded her loyalty. He gave her a golden Hackenkreuz, the swastika badge, with his name engraved on the back, and this was a sacred object to her. This he only gave to a very small, selected number of people, I mean, Goebbels and Mrs Goebbels, and, you know, that, a very small number of people. So she knew that she'd, been, she'd, she'd entered the sacred mysteries. <laughs> From that moment on, Unity Valkyrie Mitford was a guest at almost every significant Nazi event. At the 1936 Olympics in Berlin, Unity watches from a box as Hitler opens the games. Hitler drives to Vienna in triumph and declares the Anschluss from the balcony of the Imperial Hotel, where Unity briefly joins him to enjoy the cheering crowds below. Germany, in Czechoslovakia, in Vienna, and she's making quite sure that she's at every power move that they make to invade in Europe, to give her support to it, and, and just, just to be present. So she's become more than just a, 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 a groupie, really. She's, she, she's, she's become a propagandist. That summer, Hitler invited Unity to join him at his private mountain retreat, the Berghof. They spent their time talking about how Germany and England were meant to be allies together and rule the world. And Unity was very keen to tell him who in England would support him. So they drew, drew up lists. These people will have to be shot. And these people will put on jackboots and uh, rally for you and march. Hitler's circle was horrified by unity. They were very suspicious of her, and they thought she was a spy. And um, they didn't like having an English person in this intimacy with Hitler. Everybody who knew unity, even those who were very fond of her, admitted that unity could not hold her tongue about anything. She would say anything to anybody. So I think that they thought she was a loose cannon, really, and the ones who did know about her were quite frightened of her proximity to Hitler because they just didn't know. Um, I mean, she, you know, she was English, after all, and they didn't know where it would, where it would get back to. It was very strange that an English woman was able to use up so much of Hitler's personal, available time and treat him with this intimacy. I mean, he was, she was often in the Reichskanzler in, in Berlin. She was often in the, in, in, with him in Munich. He, he, he invited her to Berchtesgaden. She, it seemed, more than a hundred times. No other English person any, could have anything like that access to Hitler. While the visit to Berchtesgaden fueled speculation about their relationship, it was the events leading up to the war which convinced many reporters that Unity and Hitler were more than just friends. Well, by 1939, she wanted to live somewhere. She wanted to get a permanent address in, in Munich. So Hitler arranged through his office that she would have a choice 
of four different apartments in Munich. Unity went to this flat in 26 Agnesstrasse in Munich, and the Jewish owners were in the flat, and they knew that they were going to be dispossessed. And they were sobbing, a husband and wife. And Unity went round this apartment saying, what terrible curtains. I'll have to get rid of the curtains. Oh, dear. And I don't like this sofa. We're not going to take the sofa. And when I have this room, I'll arrange it like this, and it would be so much better if we did this, that, and the other. And she spoke of this just as though it was a question of decoration and design in front of this weeping couple who knew what was going to happen to them. It means that she's totally immersed in Nazism. She's prepared to treat these Jewish people as inhuman. And she has clearly crossed some sort of divide. But she's been living in Germany for five years, and everybody around her has crossed that divide too. After moving into her new apartment, Unity continued to see Hitler regularly. She had always believed that her bond with Hitler could lead to a lasting alliance between England and Germany. But this was a fantasy that was about to be destroyed. After March 39, when Hitler occupied the rump of Czechoslovakia, it was obvious that we were going to have a war and that appeasement had failed. And Unity's dream, if it was such, of, that she would play a part in bringing Germany and England together is clearly uh, fractured. In August 1939, Unity made her annual visit to the Wagner Festival in Bayreuth, accompanied by her sister, Diana. It was here that Hitler delivered the news that would break Unity's heart. In the interval, he told them both that war was certain and was certain to come within weeks and that they should leave, they should go home. And um, Diana did, and Unity, of course, didn't. Unity's parents, the Reedsdales, they sent her frantic telegrams saying, come home, come home. She doesn't want to. She knows what she's going to do, but, of course, she hasn't told them. On the 1st of September, Hitler invaded Poland, and two days later, Britain was at war with Germany. Unity Mitford was alone in her Munich apartment when she heard the news. Hitler had given her a small pistol with which to defend herself if anything happened. So when war is declared at 11 o'clock that morning, she takes her telephone off the hook and goes to see the uh, Gauleiter of Munich um, and says, these are the two things that are most precious to me. If anything happens to me, you will see I'm buried with them, won't you? And she then goes into the English garden, takes out the pistol, puts it to her right temple and fires. She's told me that if there was a war, which of course we all terribly hoped there might not be, uh, that she would kill herself because she couldn't bear to live and see these two countries tearing each other to pieces, both of which she loved. What she wants is to be buried in Germany, in Munich, uh, with the Nazi party badge she has and the photograph of Hitler that he has given her. But poor Unity, she was never very successful at things. She didn't quite kill herself. Unity survived thanks to the small calibre of her pistol. The bullet lodged in her brain without causing a fatal injury. After six weeks in hospital, Unity recovered the power of speech. Despite the ongoing war, Hitler came to visit her. He paid all her medical bills and arranged for her safe passage home. 
When our cameramen went to meet the cross-channel steamer, they found extraordinary precautions being taken. It was the occasion of the arrival from Germany of the daughter of Lord Reedsdale, Unity Mitford, friend of Hitler. Martin Bright's investigation has revealed that when Unity Mitford returned to Britain in 1940, she was not searched, questioned or physically examined by the intelligence services. It is now clear that it was her father's powerful connections that made this possible. My father went to see the Minister of War and said, if, she, if we'd bring her back, this was when they'd had the offer to bring her back, will she be properly treated or will she be said to have had intelligence with the enemy or something? And uh, he promised that she would be. And of course, she, that promise they kept. I mean, so she just lived with my pal. Because of her father's intervention, there is no public record of Unity's medical condition at the time. Rumours persist that she secretly gave birth at Hillview Cottage in Wigginton. Birth records examined by Martin Bright suggest the house was indeed a maternity home. And now, just five minutes' walk away, he's found a new eyewitness. Can you, hand on heart, tell me that Unity Mitford was definitely here in Wigginton during the war? Yes. Yes. Martin Bright is investigating a claim that Unity Mitford gave birth in the village of Wigginton. He's meeting resident Audrey Smith to find out more. So, Audrey, can you tell me how long you've lived in Wigginton yourself? Yes, I was born in Wigginton, so now I'm 76 years. So you've lived here all your all life? All my life, yes. So, of anyone who knows anything about Wigginton, you are the person. We've come to the right place. Well, I hope so. We've come here because we were interested in uh, Hillview Cottage. Um, can you tell me what, what that building was for, what that house was for? When I first knew it, it was new, new, used as a nursing home for, you know, ladies from farms and well-to-do people had their came there to have their babies. And who ran it? Nurse Norton. And she had two bedrooms, but she could only take one patient at a time. We have reason to believe that uh, Unity Mitford came to stay there. Do you remember that yourself? My sister worked with Nurse Norton down there and she came home one day and she said, there's a, a lady coming, she's had a nervous breakdown and she's coming for a rest to Hillview Cottage. And that lady was? Was Unity Mitford. And it was very secretive at the time. And why do you think it was quite so secretive at the time? I expect it was because she was a friend of Hitler's. And did you ever, yourself, go down to...? Oh, to... yes, I used to go and see all the babies. <laughs> and yeah. did, you, did you see Unity? I remember seeing her one day sitting out in a chair. I can, I can just think that she was poorly, you know. I had no idea why. I, I think she looked old and, you know, really old to my mind. If I were to put it to you that it has been suggested by Nurse Norton's niece that Unity did come to have a baby. What would you say to that? Nurse Norton's niece? Yes. That she came to have a baby? I would say it was rubbish. And your sister was absolutely categorical about this? Yes. Yes. That she came here to... because she was... that she'd had some sort of breakdown? Yes, she had no baby. Do you not find it nevertheless a little bit surprising that that pretty much everyone else that was staying there had a baby, but she didn't? No, because I think if someone like Unity Mitford wanted to come somewhere quiet if she'd had a nervous breakdown, Hillview Cottage would have been the place where she would probably have come. Now, Audrey Smith, the only living person who remembers Unity Mitford being in Wigington, was absolutely certain that she was there to recover from a nervous breakdown and that there was no pregnancy involved. Now, this might be the most credible version of events 
And obviously, Unity Mitford had serious problems. She had shot herself in the head. But it's still strange that in no biography, in no archive files, is there any record of her having a breakdown during this time? Or indeed, is there any record of her being in Wigington? You have to keep asking yourself, if she spent some time in a maternity home, did Unity Mitford have a baby? The question remains open. What is certain is that like all those who became close to the Nazi dictator, Unity's love for Hitler destroyed her life. In 1948, Unity's suicide attempt was finally successful. The bullet lodged in her brain became infected and she died en route to hospital, aged just 33. Unity had spent the last four years of her life on Inch Kenneth, a private island owned by the Mitford family off the west coast of Scotland. Now, all that remains is her collection of German phonograph recordings and a lingering question. What was the truth about Unity Mitford and Adolf Hitler? Her family and biographers have always maintained that their relationship remained platonic. I think Hitler would stroke her hair and say, my name is Kind, my poor child, and pat her arm. And that was about as far as it went. But I think he felt that they were two of a kind in this sense, that to be a full human being, you really have to love somebody properly and commit yourself to love. And neither Hitler nor Unity could do that. And they, they recognised that in themselves at some very profound and unconscious level. And that's what was the basis of their friendship and their relationship. It was a full-on obsession. I don't think it was a sexual obsession. I don't think that she had any adult idea of an adult relationship with him. She was extreme, and young women, especially before they've fallen in love, before they've had a full-on emotional and sexual relationship of their own, young women are capable of extreme obsessions. I would be amazed if there was ever a sexual relationship between Unity and Hitler, or if either of them ever wanted one. I really doubt it, but we never know. On Wednesday, David Starkey's monarchy, how the Windsors evolved through the last century, Boxing Day at 8.30. Followed by the Queen's wedding, the story of the royal marriage to Philip in 1947, and that's at 10. Next, without a trace 